This is a complete overview of creating your first scientific figure in Blender. From the default cube to the exported figure in your paper or PowerPoint presentation. The 3D drawing process can generally be divided into subcategories. Modeling, materials, lighting, composition, rendering and post-processing. Each of these topics can be very complex and make the objects of entire careers. And this is why I have done my best to distill those topics into simple and concrete advice. Together, we'll go through those step by step using a simple example. This is what you get when you open Blender for the first time. Oh yeah, you might want to get a mouse, it's much easier to move around. Now look at this image. It may seem complex at first, but if you look closely, it is actually just made out of three elements. Let's start by modeling a phospholipid. I will select the default cube and go to the edit mode. Select the top face, E to extrude, S to scale, left click to confirm. Now I hit F3 to look for the subdivide operation and down there we'll adjust it to two cuts. I will select these two faces, E to extrude, G to grab and press Z to lock it to the axis. Alright, we have the basic phospholipid shape. Now I will go to the modifiers tab and add some subdivision. This uh, causes some unwanted distortion, so I come back to the edit mode and using Ctrl R I add a loop cut to define the edge a bit better. Also I will select this ring to adjust it down a little bit and there we go. We have made a phospholipid model and you now know the basics of modeling. Oh yeah, also important for later, go to the edit mode, select everything and move it so that the model sits right on top of the origin, which is the little orange dot. And this will be very critical for later. For the spike protein, I will be using a trick that I explained in a previous video. I model a rough mushroom shape and then I apply a subdivision modifier to add geometry. One displace modifier with a cloud texture to make the shape a bit more random and one displacement modifier with a Voronoi texture to make it bumpy. And there you go, instant protein model. Finally for the circular DNA I add another cube. I go to the edit mode, change the shape a bit, uh, Control R and scroll up a few times to add a few loop cuts. Then I extrude these outer faces to create a small ladder step model. Then I go to the modifiers tab. I use an array modifier to make it repeat along the Z axis. Then I add a simple deform to make it twist. Set the angle to a multiple of 360 and then I add another simple deform modifier to bend it 360 degrees. To finish off, I add a subdivision surface to make it a bit smoother. 3D drawing is all about little tricks like this. You nearly never have to model anything by hand. If you want to do anything, just look for a tutorial, or there are assets online, or you could just do everything in geometry nodes. Now, speaking of those geometry nodes, now to assemble everything into a virus shape, I will show you the basics. First, I will rename my objects to keep them organized. I will add a UV sphere. Enable X-Ray to select and delete half of the vertices. Now I will go to the Geometry Nodes tab. I add a Distribute Point on Faces of our geometry and then add Instances on those points. And now I will drag and drop our Phospholipid and use it as our instance. Finally, plug the rotation into the rotation. Ok, I want to make this a little bigger and then I apply the scale. I like to control the density of the phospholipids with a Poisson disk method. This allows to set a minimal distance in order to reduce the phospholipids from superimposing too much. Now I will just duplicate these nodes to set up the other half of the lipid membrane. We just need to add a rotate Euler node. Set it to local and rotate it by 180 degrees. There we go. I duplicate the three nodes one more time to add the spike proteins. I adjust the density so that it's much lower. Also, let me go back to the original mo protein model. You can adjust it so that it looks better at any time. To add a material to an object, select it and head over to the materials tab and click new. Now you have control over the color as well as a lot of other settings to replicate the look of pretty much any material known to man. 
Honestly, for materials, if you need anything specific, just type how to make XX material on in the YouTube search bar. There are also tons of websites that provide those for free. For subsidiary scenes such as this one, I generally go for a pretty colorful look with subsurface scattering activated. This will give it that lightly organic look. So the simplest way to get good looking lighting, realistic looking lighting, is by loading in HDRI. To do this, you go to the shading tab and add an environment texture to the world and load an HDRI file. You can find those for free online. HDRIs allow you to quickly get a realistic lighting environment. But the final look sometimes is harder to predict or control, which is why I will teach you another very common way uh, using lights inside of Blender and this is called the three-point lighting system and it is used very frequently in studio photography. I position my camera on one axis, then I use the sun lamp as my main lamp and I will add two area lamps to set up my fill light and backlight. Sun lamp should be the brightest, fill light should be half as bright and the backlight can be how you want. Personally I like to make it quite strong to have some nice highlights. Composition is the art of arranging your subject in a way that is pleasing to the human eye. Now, scientists are almost never exposed to this concept in their entire life, and sometimes I definitely think that they should be. It's not just about beauty for the sake of beauty, it is actually a tool that can be used to direct the attention of your audience. We could spend hours on the topic, but I'll give you just three very important concepts. First would be rule of third pretty basic, things generally look good if you set the points of interest along the thirds of your image. You can notice this all the time in cinema and photography. Second would be color theory. Choose your colors wisely. Look at the color wheel. Choosing colors close to each other will have generally a unified and a calming feeling. But choosing opposite colors can really help to put the attention on a particular point while also staying balanced. Sometimes I struggle to find colors that match what I want to achieve with a particular piece and in that case I look at color palettes online for inspiration. Thirdly, uh, focus. Our little monkey brain can get quickly overwhelmed with too much information. Whether you are writing a paragraph or designing a PowerPoint slide, ask yourself what is the focus? And ideally you should have one main point per slide or per paragraph. Simply by being aware of it and designing your stuff around it will help you make better design decisions. Okay, I have a result that I like. Finally, it is time to render and export our image. Typically, I like to come down to color management and choose a contrast setting. Under the film settings, I will check transparency. I will increase the render noise threshold so that it renders faster. And then I come to the output properties, select your path, select your format. In my case, I'll take PNGs so that I keep the transparency and then come here to render your image. Finally, when the render is finished, don't forget to image save as so that you can then retrieve your image for your application, whatever it might be. I have done my best to condense a lot of things into a relatively short video. I hope it was not too hard to follow even for complete beginners. If I missed anything just ask in the comments, I usually respond within a day or so.